our next session, we're uh, going to sort of move from understanding the space environment to uh, thinking about policy uh, and law and what policymakers um, can be doing about it. So uh, our first speaker is um, Dr. Olavo Bidencourt Neto. Uh, he is a space law expert from the um, Catholic University of Santos in Brazil. Um, and I would appreciate it um, in the interest of time, actually. Um, hello, Olavo. If you could just Hi. give a really quick introduction um, for yourself uh, as well. Um, and we do have everybody's slides if you can't. Um, I think you want us to run your slides for you. Is that correct? I can share my screen, for, of course. Just let me okay. just try to do it. So wait, but, uh, back up if necessary. And can I please encourage please. people online to ask questions? Um, I will bring them out of the Q&A. And also people in the room think about questions you might want to ask. Over to you, Olavo. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. I'd like to thank the organizers for the kind of invitation. It's really a great opportunity to share my research as a professor of space law here at the Catholic University of Santos. And also my background experience as a member of the board of directors of the International Institute of Space Law and as a member of Brazilian delegations at the UN Corpus, the Committee on Peaceful Use of Outer Space. And uh, it's really a great opportunity to discuss space law policy and regulation with each one of you because uh, those uh, interdisciplinary uh, events uh, are really strategic for us to identify effective solutions to those many issues related to uh, not only space law and policy, but most importantly to space sustainability as a whole. Uh, during the next 10 to 15 minutes, my idea is to present a broad overview of the latest international debates and instruments we had internationally regarding long-term sustainability of outer space especially at the United Nations level. And then to present to you uh, the latest Brazilian regulation and perspectives on that regard. Uh, as I just said, I believe uh, space sustainability requires a team effort for us to find solutions. It's not only an engineer problem, we need to also identify policies and regulations that can provide uh, support for the desired behavior in relation to space exploration and use. And that's why all of us, space lawyers, engineers, government officials, uh, diplomats, we all must talk to each other. We, must, we all must try to understand our different perspectives on that regard so that we can find effective solutions. So thank you once again, Catherine, for having me here. And uh, I'd like to also greet my colleagues, Tanya Celani and Jerome Barbier. I'm really looking forward to our discussion today. So starting the clock now, I'm just going to start with my first slide here, recalling the relevance nowadays to, of space technology and space activities to each and every nation around the globe. So space activities are regarded as essential tools to the sustainable development, not only from the economic, social, but also political point of view to each and every nation. And of course, that's quite relevant also to emerging space ferry nations and developing nations as Brazil. Uh, for those activities to be performed, it's necessary for us to safeguard uh, outer space as a safe and secure environment. And that's why it's important to devise uh, policies and uh, uh, activities that can support long-term sustainability of outer space. And that has been uh, acknowledged internationally, especially in the United Nations, during the past few years, we have, have grown to realize that the orbital space around the Earth is a finite resource that is increasingly subject to uh, certain dangers. And we've had during the past presentations uh, discussed certainly uh, some of those dangers, the increased population of space debris, the problem of collisions and interferences, uh, large uh, satellite constellations, new space sectors, the increased number of space objects in low Earth orbit. So it's important for the international community as a whole to devise effective solutions to those issues. And uh, taking due regard to the corresponding interest of each and every space sector. Uh, but the problem is that we need to identify if the current regulation, the legal framework that we have right now is sufficient to provide solutions to those issues, or if we need to 
start to consider addressing additional uh, documents, additional instruments that could somehow uh, accelerate uh, the solutions to main problems that are being faced right now. Recalling the current legal framework, what we do have right now uh, in relation to binding instruments. Uh, basically, space law is nothing new. It relies upon uh, certain treaties and legal instruments that were enacted back in 1960s, uh, 1970s. And uh, we have it as our Magna Carta, the Outer Space Treaty of 67, that provides some general fundamental principles in relation to the exploration and use of outer space. And that treaty that uh, currently accounts to 112 states parties has survived without any amendment exactly because it provides broad principles that can be interpreted and reinterpreted to uh, tackle certain issues and problematics that may emerge in relation to space activities as a whole. Some of those principles are fundamental even for our discussion today about space sustainability. For instance, uh, uh, peaceful use of outer space, freedom of access of outer space, international responsibility of each and every nation in relation to all national space activities, whether governmental or non-governmental, liability for third-party damage, and also uh, the obligation to avoid contamination of outer space and taking due regard to the interests of all the other nations. Those fundamental principles are relevant nowadays whenever we try to discuss and devise international solutions as far as regulations are concerned and that somehow are connected to the long-term sustainability of outer space. But it's pretty clear that those fundamental principles are too broad in order to identify best practices and some standards of care, we need to move further. And nowadays, to even consider establishing a binding treaty, a new binding treaty on space law, it's really something quite difficult to be even thought about. So we need to devise alternatives and thinking about the different sources that we have in international law to affect the uh, behavior of states, space actors in order to support space sustainability. And how can we do that? One of the latest examples that we had uh, that were successful in one way or another was the approval in 2019 of the UN Corpus guidelines for the long-term sustainability of outer space activities, which is a quite a complex document and uh, from a uh, lawyer standpoint, it has too many words, but in any way, it provides quite a lot of information and uh, indication in relation to certain standards of care regarding several points involved in the long-term sustainability of outer space. And uh, so the document provides guidance on policy and regulatory framework for space activities, taking into account domestic space legislation, safety of space operations, which is the largest part of this document, international cooperation, capacity building and awareness, and scientific and technical research and development. And I would like to stress out that this document was negotiated at the UNCOPUS, but uh, the UNCOPUS has two standing subcommittees, a legal subcommittee and a scientific and technical subcommittee. And the guidelines were negotiated at the scientific and technical subcommittee. So, and why it was done in that way? To avoid any indication that those guidelines could be perceived as binding by any nation. So uh, the idea is that those guidelines are just uh, to be taken voluntarily in good faith by each and every nation, and especially in relation to the achievements of each and every space actor, but they are not legally binding under international law. And it is a living document, meaning that with time, it can be renegotiated and uh, the language can be uh, uh, reviewed and also additional instructions can be included in the final document. So for it to be actually implemented, international cooperation is required. Taking now into account Latin American perspectives uh, in general, uh, 
Latin American nations, they uh, consider and regard space activities as a fundamental tools to their uh, sustainable development. So the main concern in Latin American nations in general is to have a secure and sustainable access to outer space. So space activities and capabilities are seen as strategic to the sovereign interests of those nations. So uh, the space infrastructure provides strategic data and capabilities involving so many different activities, for instance, economic activities, land occupation, weather observation, frontier monitoring. So it's really broad in general in relation to uh, uh, the importance of those capabilities to uh, the nation, to those nations as a whole. So the main concern is that space capabilities can provide assistance for each and every state to answer local demands. And of course, it's important to have national legislation uh, for each and every nation that's considered a launching state because it provides, a, a, with a clear body of rules, you can provide a, a clear indication of the duties and also support and foster a national industry. But it's important to recall that those nations in general, they have uh, legislation that is basically trying to identify space capabilities as tools to address local demands. And that's the main focus of uh, most of the, all of the Latin American nations as far as space domestic regulation is concerned. And I've just concluded the paper with a colleague of mine from the Catholic University of Colombia, Jairo Becerra, where we compared legislations in many nations in Latin America, and we identified that pattern. As far as Brazil is concerned, Brazil is considered an emerging spacefaring nation, and it has a really bold and ambitious space program, dating back to the 1960s, including satellites, launching centers, and eventually a future space launching vehicle. And Brazil has uh, a space agency, the Brazilian Space Agency, AEB, which was created back in 1994 uh, to coordinate the National Space Program. But as a matter of fact, Brazil does not have a federal space law covering space activities in general. So what we do have is a myriad of regulations, many, many different uh, edicts, mostly coming from the Brazilian Space Agency that composes a really broad and fragmented body of rules. Nevertheless, we can see that Brazil intends to become uh, acknowledged and recognized as a major player in the launching market. So we can see a trend towards further regulation in Brazil as far as space activities are concerned. And we must take into account that after uh, the presidential election that we had in Brazil just a month ago, we can see that the new administration really uh, intends to focus on environmental protector, protection as a general uh, foreign policy. So we can anticipate that those discussions about environmental protection, we also uh, collide and somehow be combined with discussions in relation to the long-term sustainability of outer space. What we do have right now is uh, certain edicts that are relevant to uh, sustainability of outer space. And one of those edicts, the latest one that was uh, emitted just a few months ago, the administrative edict 698 of 2021, tried to implement partially the guidelines of UNICOPUS. So it not only acknowledges the guidelines, but also tries to implement them in relation to the licensing and authorization of non governmental launching activities from Brazilian territory, and also includes a Brazilian space regulation, which is quite a large document with over 150, 150 pages. And uh, uh, part one is considering licensing in the part two authorization. So it is an interesting document, but it's still not a federal law, an all encompassing federal law on space activities applicable, dom applicable domestically. To conclude this short presentation, and of course, I'd be glad to clarify my observations later on during Q&A. Uh, I would like to recall uh, what we're discussing nowadays at UNICOPUS regarding the future of the UN guidelines. Because uh, there's a lot of noise in relation to what 
states should try to support right now in relation to those guidelines. Uh, because we can anticipate that the greatest challenge is the implementation of those guidelines, building a standard of care that can affect the behavior of different space sectors. But uh, there's uh, some questions in relation to the best path to be followed. Should we try to improve the current guidelines, perfecting the language, and then find that we have too many loopholes and escape rules, escape routes on those provisions? Should we try to perfect the language of those guidelines? Or should we try to discuss additional guidelines for instance, covering uh, military use of outer space, which of course would have a severe impact in the long-term sustainability of outer space? Or should we try to implement the guidelines as they stand today under the risk of fragmentation? Because when they are internalized by states, of course, they're gonna try to consider first and foremost, their national interests. What we are seeing in Brazil in many other nations is that uh, uh, those nations are enacting additional regulation, trying to incorporate at least some of the guidelines approved by the United Nations back in 2019. But there is this major risk of fragmentation that can be uh, complicated down the line. So this is a really a challenging problem that requires coordinated action by the international community as a whole. And that's why I'm really glad and uh, honored to be invited to the discussion today because I believe that events like this one are instrumental for us to try to bridge our differences and try for us to identify effective solutions to the current concerns of the international community as a whole. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Olavo. Um, and we're going to hold the uh, questions to the end just uh, to make sure that we have sufficient time for everybody's talks. Um, so I'm delighted to um, ask now Tonia Saloni, who is the Deputy Director for Space Strategy and Regulation at the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy in the UK to join us. Hi, Tonia. And if you could give just a quick introduction um, and then over to you. Thank you very much. Of course. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, hopefully, Catherine, uh, I'm hoping you'll be able to, to move my present my slides, uh, if that's possible as well. Yes, that should be fine. Great. Same thank you. Uh, sure. Uh, so to introduce myself, I'm Tanya Chalani, as Catherine said, uh, our Deputy Director. I cover all things international sustainability, regulation and earth observation in the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. I've worked in the UK government since 2003 and since January have been working in the Space Directorate. Uh, really pleased and delighted to be part of the panel today with Alavo and James. Thank you very much, Catherine, for the invitation. And I can only apologise that I can't be there in person today. Uh, it might be helpful just for me to say a few things about the Bay Space Directorate, as not everyone will be familiar. It was set up just over a year ago as the home for space policy and strategy in the UK government. And we've actually helped to ensure coherence and coordination across um, government departments and work very closely with our delivery partner, the UK Space Agency. Kathleen, if you're okay to move on to the next slide. Thank you. So as we know, and, and we will hear throughout this conference over the next two days, uh, the space environment is becoming increasingly contested and congested. And as the space above us, gets busier, it's really imperative that future development in this area is done in a safe and sustainable way to ensure that space remains accessible for all. Uh, ensuring the sustainability of space environment is a priority for the UK as set out in our national space strategy and the first ever plan for space sustainability, which I will talk about in a bit. You know, for the UK, it has the industrial and academic assets and know-how to take the bold action that is very much needed on this issue. So in this presentation, I'm going to focus on three main areas. So the work that the UK is doing on space sustainability, developing effective policy, and how we work at the international level. Thanks, Catherine, if you could move on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so in September 2021, the UK launched its national space strategy. This was the first ever national space strategy, which brings together UK strengths in science and technology, uh, in defence, regulation and diplomacy to pursue a really bold national vision. 
and the strategy highlights the UK's commitment to work with industry, academia and internationally to ensure we have the safest and most effective regulation of space activities. In June earlier this year at the SWF Space Sustainability Summit in London, our science minister uh, announced the very first plan for sustainability, uh, which was effectively an ambitious package designed to show UK ambition, drive and leadership in this very critical issue. I'll talk a bit, little bit about the plan for sustain, uh, space sustainability itself. It focuses on four key areas. So firstly, on continuing UK regulatory leadership. So we are working to explore alternatives to the traditional insurance approach and developing a methodology into a proposal for consultation. We are providing funding for phase three of a project looking at the implementation of the long-term sustainability guidelines to be delivered by UNUSA. And I think for these guidelines, which Alava talked about as well, you know, a lot of time and effort was invested in developing and agreeing those guidelines it is absolutely crucial that countries are implementing them and the project we're funding with UNUSA aims to support that very, um, that very effort. And on, in, in continuing on the, on the UN engagement that we're doing, we are preparing for international meetings in 2023 and continuing to build UK leadership, drive and ambition. The second area the plan focuses on is around the review of the regulatory framework for orbital activities. So this review is underway and we're working in collaboration with industry on it and it will ensure that the UK's regulatory frameworks continue to incentivize and support sustainable behaviour, investment and growth, enabling today's innovations to become tomorrow's norms for sustainable space operations. The review encompasses a number of different work streams which have uh, been prioritised in collaboration with industry. And most immediately, we're working at PACE to deliver some, some really key milestones, which include, for example, the approach to regulation, regulating EO data security, guidance for re regulating uh, constellations, guidance for active debris removal missions, and the regulatory requirements for orbital sustainability and sustainability principles for missions. So quite a big programme of work under the re regulatory review. Uh, and over the coming years, we'll continue to work with uh, industry on this. The third area of the plan is around developing uh, an industry led standard for space sustainability, which I know Joanne Wheeler is going to talk about in the program later. Uh, so this standard will be transparent, objective and independent and will help to encourage sustainable use of the space environment, stopping the generation of new space debris and the remediation of hazardous space debris objects. And the last element of the plan I would cover is enhancing national and global capacity. So what do we mean by that? So that's continuing to support national projects on space surveillance and tracking and active debris removal. The UK is increasing its national commitment to monitoring space debris through expanding our space surveillance and tracking programme within the Civil Defence National Space Operations Centre operated by the MOD and the UK Space Agency. I think given, given the timing of where we are today, Catherine, uh, and, and the audience, I would say, you know, last week we had the European Space Agency Council of Ministers. I'd be remiss not to mention that the UK government committed £1.84 billion over the next five years at that council last week. And that represents record commitments to grow the UK space sector and to help our national space strategy ambitions, including on space sustainability. I think of particular relevance for today is that this investment included £111 million on space safety and sustainability. So that was on vigil, on space weather, uh, for ADRIOS, um, around um, demonstrating safe debris capture and removal from space and demonstrating in-orbit servicing through satellite life extension missions, and COSMIC around core activities and smaller missions covering severe space weather, near-Earth objects and clean space sustainability. Catherine, if you wouldn't mind moving on to the next slide. Thank you. So how do we develop uh, effective policy in the UK? And as, as the slide says, you know, effective research and evidence is absolutely essential to informing and developing effective policy. We do this in a number of different ways. That includes commissioning specific studies, public calls for evidence. So for example, uh, we ran a call for evidence last year to inform orbital liability and insurance policy that was published in June. We use evidence that's gathered through our stakeholder collaboration. For example, we may have hosted uh, issue specific fo focus roundtables to drill down into to important issues. 
and then there are wider engagements uh, that take place uh, through a number of different fora. And importantly, as Alago talked about, you know, we work with other space nations to gain understanding, to, to understand their experience, um, you know, trying to drive commitments in, on space sustainability is a team effort, as Alago talked about, and that's why our, our international engagement is so important. So all of this, the engagement, the research, we bring it all together, uh, and it's really key to delivering the plan for sustainability, as I mentioned, as we continue to work to grow our space economy. Um, in terms of working with stakeholders, um, as I mentioned, we have the fora with UK industry, academia and others. Um, we do a lot of cross government coordination, which is really key. So ensuring that the work aligns, that we're delivering key priorities and we can better identify areas for collaboration and improved working. If we go on to the next slide, um, how do we do this at an international um, level? So. We collaborate internationally to develop standards, regulation, norms of behaviour, agreements and best practices that influence and define the in-orbit regime of the future. We work very closely with member states through UN COPUS, you know, as Alava mentioned, you know, it's the primary international multilateral platform which will decide the future of global and commercial space regulations. It's a platform to advance priorities such as the long-term sustainability of outer space, climate change, launch, debris removal, and you know, I feel really privileged to be head of the UK delegation for UN Compuus. Uh, lastly, we're continuing to prepare for the meetings that will be taking place at the UN next year and the at working group level as well, and we'll continue to engage bilaterally and with key space nations and are working on a range of different op opportunities in the coming year. So I hope that gives you a, a sense of uh, the UK position, um, how we develop policy, how we engage internationally, and in particular, the key tenants of our, our plan for sustainability. Um, thank you so much for listening and happy to take questions at the end. Thanks so much, Tanya. Um, they, there have been questions coming in, so I'm going to move swiftly along to um, invite Jerome Barbier, who is the head of space policy at the Paris Peace Forum. Um, and Jerome, if you could possibly squeeze your talk into 10 minutes, then we'll try and put these questions um, to, to the speakers. I believe we have Jerome. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Catherine, for the invitation, and I will keep it by 10 minutes. I'm very happy to, to be here with you and the other panelists for this discussion. So let me just um, share my screen. So I will be quite short. I just wanted to give you a few elements about what we've been doing uh, at the Paris Peace Forum. So I am Jerome Barry. I'm heading the outer space and digital affairs here at the forum. Um, a few words about our organization, because we are an NGO that is working to improve global governance around the globe. And we've been starting to work on the outer space field precisely to see how we could connect space specialists and non-space specialists uh, in a, some more innovative way to support existing institutional processes, especially at UN Copios and in different regional fora. Um, you have here a short summary of our activities. So we organize an annual summit, it's usually by the middle of November and Last edition was on November 11 and 12th, uh, this year in Paris with several sessions related to outer space governance and the presentation of different multi-stakeholder deliverables on this matter. And then along the year, we have two departments working, a projects department, which is uh, aiming at showcasing existing business, um, NGO, uh, and also international organization solutions to tackle global challenges. Uh, the, 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 the rationale for this department was just to showcase the interest of the bottom-up approach, uh, especially with projects from the Global South, uh, to tackle such uh, global issues without waiting necessarily for a properly multi-stakeholder um, or multilateral approach to it. Finally, we have a policy department where I have the pleasure to work, which is here to welcome the Secretariat or different multi-stakeholder processes along the year to develop more substantive proposals and interact with existing institutional um, uh, processes uh, around the globe. In this framework, we've been starting to work uh, on the outer space governance field, especially by launching the Net Zero Space Initiative. And so this presentation is just to bring you a few elements about this experience and what we've been doing. First of all, um, I just wanted to, to put you a short slide. If we take a step back about why uh, we started to work uh, on outer space governance. The Paris Space Forum is not a space entity. We are not specialized on this issue. We are really working on, on global governance largely, which is 
uh, also climate governance, for instance, uh, the governance of digital world, uh, cybersecurity or content governance, uh, but also health and global health issues, especially after the COVID crisis. The reason why we started to focus on the outer space field was that after several contacts we had with members from the industry, but also with governments or different NGOs focusing on space issues, we shared the observation that at the end of the day, it's not really about creating new norms or creating new guidelines that we have in the, in the space field, because first of all, there are a lot of existing recommendations and guidelines that might not be exactly what we need, but are quite um, convenient when it comes to ensuring a sustainable space sector. Um, and we have a lot of processes and especially a lot of institution, um, the first of which is UN Copios, that is here to design uh, guidelines and good behaviors when it comes to ensuring a sustainable space sector. The point was much more about three issues that were not tackled at the moment for different reasons. First of all, the actual implementation of these guidelines. Second, uh, when it comes to the existing legal frameworks of different space nations, the absence of a level of playing field uh, that was, I mean, guided by sustainability standards and which connects with the lack of interoperability between the different requirements that we have among different space nations around the globe, especially if you include um, in the equation non-Western nations, uh, including China, India, for instance, but also nations from the global south that are trying to enter the space sector uh, with their own uh, problematics and uh, their own um, point of view on this. So, we, want, we wanted to launch something, and this is the, 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 the reason why we started to work on this sense of best initiative, to launch something that would um, enable uh, member, I mean, committed actors uh, gathered in this coalition to raise awareness to policymakers at a political level, but also uh, to the public at large about the importance of ensuring sustainability in orbit and not just sustainability on Earth through space infrastructures. It was also an opportunity to I mean, raise awareness and try to bring the message within the space community that it was not just, uh, let's say, a technical or working level approach. There are properly political issues and larger issues that are related to space sustainability. Um, I would take just one example, for instance, because in a lot of for our discussion, people mentioned market access and the fact that regulators, for instance, could actually require a certain level of sustainability standards uh, from foreign operating entities uh, to enter the market and to provide services related to space infrastructures in their own uh, nation. Well, such measures would actually interact with WTO or if we think of Europe, EU standards when it comes to access to market and it cannot be handled or tackled only um, by, by space specialists or by space discussion. It needs to actually gather space and non-space specialists around the table. So this is where uh, we wanted to go. And to do so, so we launched this Net Zero Space Initiative. Uh, what is the Net Zero Space Initiative? Well, it's something that actually connects with what the forum is doing. First of all, it's an informal initiative. So it's not binding under national or international law. It's really a political declaration gathering, um, uh, the, I mean, gathering actors around the common observation that we have, I mean, we need to take urgent action to protect Earth orbit and environment in the short term. And the two main directions to do so are, first of all, to mitigate space debris, and second, to remediate space debris. The idea was just to have a declaration that would take a political format that would actually connect with press, with policymakers, and something that would actually bring a bit more attention outside the people usually um, bringing some attention towards space sustainability. It's open to all actors uh, that would actually want to support this declaration and would, when supporting the declaration, present a form of good practices it is implementing uh, aligned with the principles of the declarations so that, of course, there is some sort of uh, some sort of price to, to sign on this declaration, and it's not just a, I mean, a vain signature. Uh, we are gathering actors from uh, all of the, the space value chain, but also beyond the industry, including public authorities, including entities or companies that are not directly space operating entities, but still extremely depending on space infrastructures, including tech companies, for instance. And what for? Uh, we, want, we put the initiative precisely to, to bring a bit more political awareness on the matter, to increase the political pressure and to create, I would say, the socio-political background that we would need to actually put some fuel in existing institutional processes and to get actual implementation of standards and norms. Uh, you have here a short summary of the, the different uh, repartition of uh, entities um, present in the coalition and of the countries represented, so not all represented uh, on the governance side, of course, is a country um, from which um, our supporters are originated from. Um, the, the main point about this initiative is that first, 
it remains a multi-sig order. So we have uh, inputs, and it was mentioned before, it's very important to have inputs from both diplomats, members from the industry, civil society, academia, government entities um, on, on this. But we also have a global initiative. And it's very important in every workshop or every uh, working groups that we have, and we mentioned that um, a bit later, um, that we keep every point of view at the table. If we want to find solutions or principles that will last on the medium to long term, it's important that even emerging nations actually have something to say when it comes to defining the principle, otherwise it will not work. And I would actually say very simply, um, the reason why it wouldn't work is that it doesn't take um, a structural economic dominance um, to threaten the orbital environment. It would only take one very bad behavior or one accident to potentially have catastrophic effect on the scale of the whole environment. So here is a, a short summary of uh, our supporters, uh, and I'm sure you will recognize a, a, a few names among them. Um, maybe directly going to, to this part, uh, in addition to the, let's say, PR um, and event work that we are doing in the framework of this initiative, and of course the idea of connecting um, different entities and creating a community effect, we've been welcoming in the framework of it um, different substantive processes in the, in the format of working groups to develop some more concrete policy recommendation to actually nourish the debate on, on space sustainability standards. Uh, on, over the last year, we had two working groups, uh, one focusing on comparing the existing states of mitigation and remediation requirements in 17 spacefaring nations, both um, historic, emerging from the west, from the east, north, and in the south, to see what was the state of the art, first of all, where were the main convergences and so what sort of requirements were consensual and where were the main gaps and things that would be needed to, to tackle. Our positioning for this initiative is that um, even if we need to support and we need to continue the different international processes, some form of coordination between some key specific nations that would make national reform in the same direction on the same standards for critical issues, which may be remediation, which might be also about certain form of mitigation guideline, would already reach a form of critical effect on the state of the space market and would actually unlock a lot of things when it comes to international discussion, especially in the framework of UN copious. And shortly a few words after, about the second working group. It was a very interesting discussion because this one had a more technical subject. If we read it through, it was about the apprehension of the collision risk in orbit. Um, we worked um, with a um, programmatic approach, uh, actually quite comparable with what um, the United Kingdom uh, did with the 2020 resolution on space threat, where they were requesting from every government to define according to them and without other consideration, what would be a space threat and then it enabled the UN to compare everything that happened. We put a questionnaire to see, okay, according to your entities, and uh, there were participants from the US, from China, from Europe, from the UK, um, and from the Global South too, from the different sort of entities and uh, in your different nations, how do you define, first of all, the risk of collision, but then how do you actually apprehend it um, concretely when there is such an event occurring? Who is deciding that there is a risk of collision? Do you contact uh, your counterpart? What happens when your counterpart doesn't answer? Uh, do you need to notify a public regulator, which is actually something very important for a lot of nations outside of Europe and North America? Um, and what is the decision-making process internally? Uh, you have, for instance, companies where the decision to move a satellite goes back to the sea level, uh, and some of them for which it remains at the technical level, especially when there is automation processes. So this is how we've been working, and uh, I would maybe just uh, stop here with a short presentation to keep some time for the questions. Thanks very much, Jerome. Um, there have been some questions, and we'll try and squeeze a couple of them in before the end of the session. Um, I'd like to start with a question from Dan Hawk uh, online. He's saying spacefaring and indigenous peoples are sometimes at odds. Um, the UN uh, position re indigenous peoples is equal access to space is a human right, and there is a right of self determination. Latin America has many indigenous peoples, and we Native Americans are preparing to secure our own spaceport, uh, which is interesting news to me. That's interesting. And how do you see indigenous peoples in space law? I'm going to put that first to Olavo, but then um, perhaps ask Jerome to give his views on that as well. Olavo? Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's a really great question, Dan. 
I thank you for presenting that question because Brazil may provide a case study in relation to indigenous people and space activities because for due to so many different reasons. But just to put it uh, in clear terms, first of all, those communities in Brazil they are really remotely located, so uh, space technology can provide access to those communities to the central government facilities and uh, to have them access to fundamental governmental services that may not be provided due to their location. But also in Brazil, we have another concern is that uh, we are finding a lot of space debris, surviving debris from reentry being identified in the Amazon, throughout the Amazon, and being located by indigenous communities. And of course, it puts them in danger whenever we have uh, certain debris, for instance, hydros in tanks that survive reentry. And also, there's another concern in relation to indigenous communities regarding launching centers. Uh, Brazil's largest launching center is located really close to what's called quilombolas communities, communities of former slaves that, that were able to escape uh, those farms back 200 years ago, and they have developed uh, certain villages, and they have the property of the land, but they are located really close to uh, the safety zones applicable to the Brazilian launching center of Alcântara. And that has raised quite a lot of conflicts, not only between the communities and the administrators of the launching center, but also between members of the community and the Brazilian government in general. And uh, I believe that uh, we're going to see a lot of movement on that regard, maybe some interesting changes in Brazil due to uh, the results of the latest presidential election. And uh, it's, of course, we need to put everybody in the equation for us to find solutions to space sustainability. And uh, the indigenous people, they must be heard. They have a, a lot uh, to contribute to the discussions, especially taking into account those uh, specific references that I made regarding the situation down here in Brazil. Um, thanks, Olavo. And Jerome, I'll give you the last word because I think um, we are coming to the end of the session and um, we have a very exciting uh, thing for the in-person delegates to participate in next. Um, and I don't want to keep those people waiting. Um, so, um, Tonya, there have been questions coming in and I might just send them to you directly. Um, uh, Jerome, your, your final thoughts on indigenous peoples and how they can be um, in, included in space policy formulation? Well, that's a very important question, I think. And uh, I think that the question points out that actually it's uh, that we need to work better on inclusion when it comes to defining space policy. So the, of course, we would say that indigenous people can actually be included through their own government, but I would say that we need to define more innovative way so that every voice can be included in the policy discussion, and especially that, for instance, association representing the rights of indigenous people can actually have a seat at the table by themselves. So I know that there are different processes, for instance, at UN Copios, so that stakeholders might be involved in that framework, but we need to put the word out there actually that you, you don't need to only be like a technical expert to be here at your copious discussion and we would need to actually support the participation of such association and such representatives. Thanks Jerome. Thanks so much to all of the speakers. Um, really interesting food for thought. Um, lessons learned for next time. Leave more time for questions for all of us. Um, but it's a really good segue into uh, what we're going to be doing next. And I'm very sorry that the people online aren't going to be able to join us for this. Um, but it's about getting all the voices heard. I'd like to um, hand the mic to James Blake uh, to talk about some of the voices we're about to hear. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so as you can probably tell from my slightly disheveled appearance, we've got 60 year fives on campus at the moment. Um, and we've been taking them through a range of activities throughout the day. They're gonna do some more in the afternoon. Um, but right now we've got um, an exhibit set up in the room just next door. Um, so if you leave this room, just head straight down to the end of the corridor if you'd like to go to the exhibit. Um, I'd encourage you also to get coffee um, during your break as well, so we can stagger the number of people going in because it's going to be quite crowded in there, I imagine. Um, but um, the Year Fives have done a fantastic job. I'm actually blown away by some of the work that they've um, they've been working on in the past month. We launched a project in World Space Week in early October, 
um, and they've been working on ideas for sustainable space operations. Um, and I'd highly encourage uh, anyone who's an in-person delegate to uh, check out their work, um, show them some enthusiasm, ask them questions about what they've been up to. Um, and quite a few of them are very excited, I think, to, uh, to chat to you all. Um, so with that, I'll, um, I'll close this session um, and invite you to um, head to coffee and the exhibit if you get a chance. Thank you very much.